Welcome everyone to our September 2021st talk. I'm Mark Turner filling in this month for our executive director, John Kruth. Uh, we are privileged to have with us today, Joe McMonigle, retired Army Chief Warrant Officer and world-renowned remote viewer to talk about effective remote viewing targets. Uh, I'm really happy to have you all here at today's talk. If you aren't a member of the Rhine, we really wanna encourage you to join. Uh, it helps us continue to do these types of events and also assist with our research and our education opportunities as well. So please sign up if you would, you can go to rhine.org and find um, membership um, options there and uh, we encourage you to do so. So thank you very much. Um, today we will hear from Joe and then we will have a quick Q&A following that. So feel free to direct any questions that you have to me in the Zoom chat and uh, I will pose them to Joe at the end of the session or maybe we'll even open it up to, to everybody uh, at that point. So, and now without further ado, let me introduce today's special guest. Joseph W. McMonagle is a retired Army Chief Warrant Officer with 12 plus years of service overseas as an intelligence officer. He has 34 years of professional experience in research and development of numerous multi-level technical systems, the paranormal and social sciences. Joe is the owner and director of Intuitive Intelligence Applications Incorporated, providing support to multiple research facilities in the areas of anomalous cognition. He was a member of the Army Stargate program from start to finish. He's a full member of the Parapsychological Association, as well as a member of the board of directors of the Rhine Research Center. So he's one of ours. As a psychic, Joe, of course, has worked with the CIA, DIA, NSA, DEA, Secret Service, FBI, and most other agencies, as well as the Department of Defense. He successfully demonstrated remote viewing more than 50 times on two national level television shows in seven countries with a better than 80% success rate. His 28 military awards include the Legion of Merit, and he's also authored four books on remote viewing, Mind Trek, Ultimate Time Machine, Remote Viewing Secrets, and Stargate Chronicles, Memoirs of a Psychic Spy, all published by Hampton Roads. So let me introduce to you everyone, Joseph W. McMonagle. And let me go ahead and make sure Joe's off mute and uh, we will begin. Uh, let's see. Take it away, Joe. Can you can we hear you? Can you hear me, everybody? Yes, looks good. Can everybody hear me? Yes. All right, good. And Can once again, if I, if I may, Joe, everyone, please um, turn off your cameras for today's recording. Thank you. All right, Joe, go ahead, please. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, targeting. A lot of people think, well, a target is just something you open up a National Geographic and pull out a, a page and say, well, this is a pretty good target. Uh, what you may not know is prior to 19, uh, 1985, uh, just in the period of time from about 1978 until uh, 1985, there were an awful lot of different kinds of targets that were tested or, or were actually used in a research sense. I'm going to name a few of them. I wrote down a lot of this stuff because it's almost too much to remember. Uh, we have abstract targets. I'm, gonna, I'm naming them in order of how they were tested, generally speaking. We had abstract targets, uh, which were the kinds of targets that uh, the military might have been interested in. Uh, an abstract target might be um, where, where is the, where is the, uh, the latest, uh, latest type of submarine? located right now versus any old submarine. Um, and how do we locate it? That kind of thing. Analytic targets. Uh, these are targets that have to do with, uh, with uh, analysis of, a, of, a main, of an actual target that's been broken down into parts and pieces. Ordinate targets. Uh, everybody knows that. That's uh, where you use the geographic locations. Uh, dynamic targets, that's a target that's actually active. Uh, geographic targets, local targets, long distance targets, that's how far away a target can be and we can still get information on it. Uh, we haven't been able to outdistance the ability of remote viewing, so I can't answer that. Um, many targets, many targets are how small the target can be. Uh, normally speaking, it would be uh, targeting a lab and talking about an object sitting on a table, 
as an example, um, or targeting a typewriter, for instance, and knowing whether or not the typewriter has been rigged in some way uh, to do other things than just type normal letters or something. Um, outbounder targets, real-time targets, random targets, static targets, and target pools. Uh, the difficulty in addressing all of these is that no matter which type of target you select, there's always a, a commonality in the way that uh, they're approached. Uh, the primary uh, way that all targets are approached in remote viewing is that uh, the people who are responsible for producing the information on the target, no matter what kind of a target it is, uh, will always be completely blind to the target. And that means uh, not only when you're doing the target you're doing the targeting for uh, collection purposes, or you're doing the targeting for some other reason than uh, training. If you're doing training, uh, there are some things that people do because they say, well, while we're training, it's necessary to modify the, uh, the protocol. Uh, the reason for the modification of the protocol is because we have to know how good or how bad the remote viewer is doing while they're actually remote viewing. Uh, that's not completely true. Uh, there's a problem with that. If you are using, let's say, uh, geographic coordinates or you're using uh, targets that are local targets or targets that are uh, long distance targets or geographic type targets, um, these kinds of targets, if you know what the target is and you're sitting anywhere in the proximity of the remote viewer, uh, the remote viewer doesn't have to worry about getting anything about the target. All they have to worry about is, is watching you and reading, reading uh, your reactions to what they might be saying. So you can't train somebody as a remote viewer and not also uh, know what the target is. So there are a lot of training methodologies in use today where someone knows what the target is, they're sitting in front of the viewer, and they're either responding or not responding. They're responding in a very specific way when the viewer is wrong or right, or they're not responding when the viewer is wrong and responding when they're right. Uh, regardless of how that might work, what happens is you wind up training the viewer to be ultra sensitive to you're getting warmer, you're getting warmer, that kind of thing versus uh, you're getting colder, you're getting colder. In other words, you're getting farther away from the description we're looking for, you're getting warmer, you're getting closer to the description we're looking for. So if you're, if you're trained in that methodology, uh, you, you certainly learn a lot about human nature and you learn a lot about uh, reading the person sitting in front of you, which uh, uh, I guess if you're going to be an interrogator, that's a good thing to do. Uh, but if you're going to be a remote viewer, that's not a good way to learn remote viewing. The best way to learn remote viewing is when you're completely blind, the person you're with is completely blind, uh, whether it's a monitor or an instructor, or whoever it might be, and the target is chosen randomly. The whole reason for target pools is to is to coordinate the collection of targets uh, where you can restrict them into a very specific uh, type of target. If you start creating pools where you have lots of different styles of targets, for instance, if you have geographic targets mixed with long distance targets, mixed with many targets and outbound targets and random targets, static targets, that sort of thing. What happens is you confuse the remote viewer and the remote viewer who's trying to learn what to do uh, can't adjust or alter their viewing style in order to pick up the necessary materials they need to pick up on each of those targets. So when you fashion a teaching pool, uh, you need to you need to actually collect the targets for that pool 
under whichever of these uh, of these coordinated uh, types of uh, targeting you might want to do. Uh, for instance, if it's outbounders, uh, you need to know who your outbounder is going to be, where they live, and they need to submit whatever might be a collection of targets in their area that they can actually go to. And you need to know what those targets are because targets will vary in size, they'll vary in condition, and they'll vary in how much access you might have to them. And an outbounder target, you want the outbounder to be able to interact with the target because the interaction with the target generates something uh, that you don't get otherwise, uh, which leads me to talk about something called, uh, 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 we're, we need to, uh, uh, I need to cover one other thing first. Um, uh, one of the, one of the things that we know about targets is that targets that are dynamic targets, which most of the targets should be dynamic. Uh, meaning real targets, targets that have action or something going on in them in the, uh, the target photograph or, or something to do with uh, uh, activity. Uh, we have uh, some, some interesting, uh, we have some interesting changes that take place at a target in the mind of the viewer. Um, if a viewer is doing uh, doing a, uh, the geographic target and it's a dynamic target, then we have a thing called entropy that might be taking place in the target itself. If we're using photographs, it's a different type of entropy from normal entropy. If it's a actual target that you have an outbounder going to, that's another type of entropy. I'll talk about that type of entro entropy first. Um, if you, the point being that you need to have targets with entropy, higher levels of entropy to make them decent for doing remote viewing. The lower the degree of entropy, the less information is being passed, and you're not going to be you're not going to be getting as good a result off the target as you would if the remote viewer was targeting something that had a high level of entropy. Entropy in its normal sense means, uh, well, the way the description of entropy in the normal sense would be something like um, you have a, cu a cup of black coffee and you drop a, a small drop of cream into the, the black coffee. And as it spreads through the black coffee, it changes the color. You can't Entropy in the normal sense is something that where change is introduced in an object, but you can't reverse it in time. In other words, you can't take the cream out of the coffee and make it go back to being black. So a cup of black coffee with cream dropped in it would be an entropic change in the target. And that would be a really good target. So if the target is, let's say, a uh, 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 I don't know, a, a small diner or something. And it looks like an old 1950s diner and it makes a really great tar target location. Well, the, the outbounder that's at that target should go in and sit down at the counter and order something. Better to order something that's in, that has an in, entropic change to it. So you would order you know, the coffee, or you'd order a plate of something that you're going to eat, because once you eat it, you can't reverse it. You understand? That, that's a, that's kind of a, uh, an entropic target in the real sense. Most of the training pools that we use, however, we use natural targets, or we use uh, coordinate targets, where we have a photograph of the specific coordinate, where an object's located, or like a, uh, maybe it's a radar reflector dish or something like that, uh, where you use, uh, uh, where you use uh, actual targets, coordinate targets uh, of objects or pictures of them rather. And you use pictures of uh, other targets that have some entropic change in them like bowling alleys or stuff like that. Um, if it's 
a photograph target, then the entropy is different. The entropy is actually measured as a uh, difference in change between the amount you take uh, a certain a certain uh, a certain segment of that target in the photograph, and you measure. It. There's an algorithm for it, which I don't I don't have, but I'll tell you where you can get it. Um, it's an algorithm where you measure the difference between the shadow and the light in the photograph. And that gives you an entropic change difference in the photograph. And if all the photographs are approximately the same, they have the same weight, then the information coming from the photograph, which relates to the actual target, will be pretty much the same. Uh, otherwise, if you don't have the entropy and measured entropy of the different photographs, what you can have is you can have uh, what appears to be a really good target, which has low entropy versus a, uh, a less good target, or what looks like a less good target with higher entropy. And you'll get more information off the target you don't think is as good as the other one. And, and this causes a lot of grief for the remote viewer because the remote viewer will get all always do better with the target that produces more information than the target that doesn't. Um, I'm going to show you the book you can get this information from. It's actually two, two editions. The first, the first edition is volume one, remote viewing. It says 1972 through 1984, but in actuality, when they talk about targeting, they're really talking about approximately 1977, somewhere in there, in 1985. It's uh, mostly in the earlier part, uh, page 21, or rather 17 to 21. They talk here about uh, the the beginnings of remote viewing research. And then they go into all the different forms of targeting. And they talk about the differences and the reliabilities and, and uh, what you can expect from those types of targets. And the entire book only goes to 85, however. In 1985, there is a whole lot more information that was discovered about the, the targeting methodologies. And that's 85 to 95 and you go to the back of the book and you just look at targets and it'll tell you where to go in the book to understand what uh what what i just told you about uh uh the information differences in the different targets it's it's real important that you understand that each target has a, a quality to it which is uh which is solely dependent on the type of target it is. And it has a, a, a large degree of difference in how much the entropy that exists in the target is. So if you're doing, uh, when you start getting into the more exotic targets like uh, locational targets, uh, locational targets have a huge amount of entropy but if you don't develop a systematic way of going at that target as a viewer, what will happen is you'll get lost in all of the information that it provides. In other, in other words, you'll, you'll be getting lots of information that aren't pertinent to locating. You'll get a lot of information about the person or the, the object that you're looking for that is not material to, to its uh, location. Uh, in order to, to know more about the location, then you have to have a systematic way of breaking down that information and providing only that information to the people who are doing the search or the look. Uh, as an example, uh, let's say you have a, a search problem where you're looking for a missing person. Uh, the person has uh, been accused of stealing money and so they, they ran away. They, they disappeared into the woodwork of the, the local city that they're in or moved to another city, changed their name, 
change their look, change the way they act, uh, got a different job, did all those things, and uh, and no one can seem to find them. Uh, but with a photograph of the individual or a good description of the individual, if uh, if you do that individual in a locational type targeting, uh, what you need to do is you need to be able to first explain what city they're in versus what and maybe what's going on with them with within that city uh you can't just say uh you know they're in a city with so many millions of people and and then uh or give some very vague description of their location and expect somebody to come up with an idea of where that might be you know next to a large tower uh, with a railroad track and in a pool and that sort of thing. Um, one of the ways that I've always done that in a search search location is uh, my my remote viewings generally when I do a search uh, for a missing person, as an example, uh, my remote viewings usually last a period of somewhere between six and 12 hours and they're nonstop. I, once I begin a locational target, I don't stop. Uh, the first thing, obviously, is you have to be able to describe in detail, in some sort of detail, what city the person's in. And the way you can do that, um, what I do is um, I describe any of the uh, associated locations around the city that might give a better idea of its location. Like if it has a coastline, I try to draw the coastline as accurately as possible. Uh, if there's mountains or rivers or things like that, ge geographic materials there, then I will sketch in the material uh, where the rivers go, where the lakes might be, that kind of thing. Uh, I also try to add the main roads or the, the service roads that are located within the city. And then I put in some locations and I just mark them by, by noting them on the drawings. Uh, I might say, uh, these are the, the primary subway lines through the city and notate which subway stops are there. Subway stop one through eight, for instance. Um, I'll add in uh, main police stations, uh, hospitals, uh things like that things that seem to be dynamically important to that city and then i try to find three or four buildings in the city that are really unique that to that city uh, for instance there are buildings when they're built by certain companies uh, they only build one one of those kinds of buildings it, you know as an example uh, i think it's uh uh, Osaka and Japan, they have a, a building with a big hole in the center of it uh, that that's used to identify uh, Osaka as being one of the cities. In any event, within that same drawing, I try to locate those different buildings, and then I'll do separate sketches of each of the buildings, equating to their number on the map uh, that I'm, I'm consolidating. At some point, I get enough information on the map so that the city is well identified. And then I pick a point or a place within the city that I've drawn. And I say, beginning at this building, which I drew and located, uh, you would leave this building or this subway stop or this police station by the front door, side door, or whatever, going in a specific direction. And I give them the the distance that you would have to travel in a straight line from whatever that location is. Uh, you then, wherever there's a turn, if there's a left turn or a right turn, I always draw or sketch that, that corner so that when they make that turn, they know they're actually staying on the road they're supposed to be on and not sliding off into an alley or something. Because in a lot of different cities, the roads are uh, sometimes too close together to separate. Um, once I get the locations down in the turns and the distances and whatnot, when I eventually get to the area where I think the subject is, then I ask myself what kind of a 
place the subject might be living in. And it's usually a town home, an apartment, uh, a regular house, uh, whatever. They may be uh, you, using a temporary residence like the back room of a warehouse or they could be sleeping in the wild even under a tent for, for all you know. But you write all these things down and you try to you try to lay it all out as a city with a specific location and that gives them a place to start and you can actually give them a sketch of the individual in many cases or a description of the individual which they can hand to people in that area and then uh, they can turn this over to uh, police or private agency or whatever is going to help look for the person and then they can go and uh, actually apply it. Um, it this is a very specific way of approaching uh, a lost object or a lost person that sort of thing um, finding animals is a little different. Um, you obviously can't, you can give the really good descriptions of animals better than human, in fact, because many animals have unique things about them that are different from the, any other animal like them. Uh, you know, maybe it's the shading around their eyes or their, their fur or whatever, but, uh, and, and they have unique things that they'll do some will answer to their name some won't some will run some won't uh, but you give as much of that information as you can along with the location and uh, what usually happens is the person will go to that location that you give them and call the name of the animal and they'll they'll pop out of the bushes or something um, when it comes to coordinate targeting one of the mistakes that a lot of people make I think is when they're given a set of coordinates uh, to be targeted on, they sometimes make an assumption that, uh, that it is a set of coordinates for this planet. It may not be. Uh, so you can't make an assumption that it's below the equator or above the equator, things like that. Uh, South America, North America, uh, Europe, Western Europe, Eastern Europe. You can't make any of those assumptions because the coordinates uh, may fool you. There, there are times when the coordinate is not going to even be this planet. It might be somewhere off planet. Um, there are times when there are no coordinates or the coordinates are blind, in which case the coordinates are changed to a number, a set of numbers or something like that. One of the one of the things I always tell people is the no matter what kind of target you're doing, the first thing that will pop into your mind is your gestalt. Gestalt is uh, is kind of like a uh, a hint that the subconscious gives. Your subconscious will always give you a hint about the target before it starts giving you or feeding you specific information. Uh, I think it's a way of the, the subconscious trying to orchestrate you into a specific position of thinking. Uh, so the, the gestalt's extremely important. Plus, the first information that pops into your mind is always going to be pertinent. Uh, so regardless of how you might feel about it or think about it in terms of its accuracy, you need to put it down. Um, I've had uh, information pop into my mind that that didn't seem logical at all. And I put it down and it happened to be more logical than I thought. As an example, um, I had a, uh, a large building pop into my head once with uh, a whole lot of very bizarre uh, things at the top of the building and the building was only seven or eight stories tall but up on the roof of the building they had these materials that were going way off the roof off over the edge and much higher and and they didn't make any sense in connection to the building and i almost didn't pay attention to it but then 
I always remember one thing, and that is that the subconscious never lies and the system always works. So in that, that was the first information I got, I put it down and it turned out that the building actually had a, uh, a roller coaster, a Ferris wheel, um, and a number of other rides on the roof of the building. And they were established or designed to, to give a lot of thrill. So if you were in a roller coaster on a seven story building, and you went way out over the edge while you were dropping it, that, you know, that makes it a much more exciting ride. And that I think is, is why they put it there. In any event, it located the building for me very quickly. Um, it made the building a lot easier to describe and draw. And uh, it, it, it was very accurate. So, so whatever you get is first input, that's important. Um, local targets are targets that you will generally use for, uh, for target pools because you, you can hire people to be outbounders, or you can ask your friends to be an outbounder and go and interact with a target. Um, the problem is, uh, local targets people think that you don't have to be as careful with local targets because you don't know, uh, you don't know the people that are going to be the outbounders or if you have an outbounder present and they send the outbounder out, just watching the direction in which the outbounder is going can sometimes give a hint on what target they're going to in all probability. It makes guessing sometimes easy. So you should make a point of, with the remote viewer, preventing the remote viewer from seeing in which direction the outbounder is going uh, or which way they're driving off, that sort of thing. Uh, the protocol that we used at SRI was very stringent. We had uh, all of the outbound targets that were local were all in separate envelopes and they were sealed and they were all inside, they were all numbered and they were inside a uh, a safe and only one person had access to the safe and they didn't know what was in each of the envelopes. So whenever we did a local target, uh, the person who had access to the safe would generate a random number uh, with a random number generator and I should say pseudo random number generator. And uh, they would go to the safe, open the safe, and assist the outbounder by pulling the specific target package out and handing it to the outbounder. And the outbounder would then get in their car and drive away, only they wouldn't know where they were going. They would just drive away and drive around for 15 or 20 minutes before they would stop and then open the envelope and it would tell them what target that they had to go and interact with. Um, you wanna always interact if possible with the target. If you're an outbounder, uh, if it's a bowling alley, you go in and bowl a game. If it's a restaurant, go in and have coffee and a donut. Um, if it's a shop, go in and produce the materials at the shop. Uh, your interaction with the target makes the target far more richer from an, from an entropy standpoint than the target would be if you just stood outside and took pictures of it. Um, being in the target is is far better and the in the requirement on the viewer then is not to just state it looks like a bowling alley no you have to be able to say things about the inside the outside what's going on inside maybe there's a tournament going on that sort of thing the more information you can provide the better the remote viewing and in fact, the, re the quality of the remote viewing is the whole idea behind training. You want to generate a much higher quality of viewing for each of the targets. So again, uh, local targets that are used with outbounders um, should be targets that they can actually interact with uh, locally. Um, long distance targets aren't used very often. Uh, many targets are an interesting issue. I never see those used much 
by people who are training. But if you have an empty room or an empty box or an empty place that you can put something like an object, the object can be as simple as a pencil or it could be something alive like a, uh, a beetle or a, a butterfly or something um, in a cigar box. Uh, these all make great targets and the remote viewer should have to explain what they're seeing or perceiving inside whatever that container is. It's okay to say it's a container or it's a room or, you know, it's the garage at my uncle's house, that sort of thing. But the idea is not to say, not for the remote viewer to describe the garage or the the room in the uncle's house. The idea is the remote viewer should be describing whatever was picked, whatever mini target was picked to be inside a box there or inside a container there. Uh, targeting mini targets uh, is really an exceptionally good way of learning remote viewing from a task standpoint. Um, just remember that the more dynamic the target is, the, the, the more uh, entropic the target is, uh, the better. In other words, if it's an ink pen, it should be an ink pen that has X amount of ink in it and that's usable. Uh, if it's a dry ink, ink pen, it's not going to be as uh, entropic as one that has ink in it that's used on a continual basis. Um, Let's see, uh, real-time targets versus future targets or past targets. Um, when you start looking at targets in the past, targets in the future, or real-time targets, which we apparently want to say are happening like right now, uh, there's very little difference in terms of remote viewing. We have discovered over time that regardless of whether the target is a future target or a past target or a target in real time, we don't know if the viewer has made contact with the target until after the remote viewing has been completed and we get feedback. In, in the sense that we get feedback after everything's been done in the remote viewing, we have to say that the target is actually a precognitive target. So whether it's a past target or a present target or a real-time target um, or a future target, it, it's always a precognitive target. Um, what that means is that you should not have any feedback at all on the target until the entire remote viewing has been completed. So if someone gets a partial remote viewing and wants to work on it longer, give them time to work on it because it may be that they didn't get a good signal line or they didn't get a good connection uh, with the target initially, and they may get one better later and they want to improve the remote viewing. They want to work at it a while, whatever. It doesn't matter whether they're working on it in real time or they're actually working on it later. Uh, in some cases, I've done a number of targets before they even became targets. And that's going to take some explaining, I think. Um, I used to have to do a demonstration of remote viewing uh, for a certain, uh, certain group of people in the military. And I found that it was beginning to bother me that I was always the one that was selected to do a demonstration. And uh, it would put a lot of stress on me. So I told my boss, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do this anymore. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, do the remote viewing before we have the meeting and just provide them with the, the uh, report of the remote viewing. And he said, well, you know, of course, in many cases, they, they do their own targeting. In other words, they put together their own targets. So uh, we don't know what that target's going to be 
and they they may not know for until the very hour before you're de, you're supposed to be demonstrating the target and i said well it shouldn't matter uh the results would be the same whether i remote view it now or after the target selected and he agreed so we started doing reports on the targets before they were selected and it turned out that those reports were just as accurate as the remote viewing that was done real time after the target was selected so they're all precognitive if you accept that fact then you can trust the system to give you the information you need before the targets ever even selected i don't know if that makes sense to anybody out there but that's a unique way of demonstrating remote viewing in a, in a really solid way where they get it immediately. Uh, random targets, static targets. Oh, there's a, one of the things about abstract targets, uh, abstract targets have a lot to do with location. And it's the, the reason why is because location uh, sometimes is, um, we know a general area, so we know the location is going to be within a general area. And if you have more than one viewer, what you can do, you can actually use a computerized system for inspecting the entire area. You break it up into squares, you identify the squares, and you have the computer rotate through the squares in a random way and you can hook that system up to a button and have your remote viewer hit the button at the point where they believe the actual location is going to be displayed in the identity of the square that the target's actually in if you have four or five remote viewers and you have them run through this targeting methodology where they hit the button when the square that's going to be displayed next is the target location what happens is you'll get a statistical response uh, there'll be a number of squares there might be 25 or 30 squares let's say it's uh you're looking for gold on a shoreline and you're looking at a shoreline that's 100 miles long and you have that shoreline broken up into squares uh, let's say 100 squares, each representing 100 by 100 meters. Um, over time, you will have a statistical response where one square becomes more frequently hit by the remote viewers by pressing the button than any other square. And you'll find that that's the actual square that gives you the answer for what it is you're looking at. That would be an abstract way of getting at the targeting information. Uh, dowsing is another way. Um, it's sometimes easier to just douse a map and give a location on in a city or in a location on a map where you might find the person faster. Uh, so abstract approaches are fine if you can design one that interacts with the computer or otherwise. Uh, you could use a, I think a spinning wheel for that matter. Um, it seems to me you could use almost anything abstractly representing the target or the possible location in a target uh, because you don't know what's gonna be coming up on the squares uh, that are being presented. You don't know which one since it's random you don't know which one's going to be popping up when that person hits the button, that kind of thing. Um, long distance targets are great. Um, we did long distance targets out to outer rim planets. Uh, the difficulty with an, a long distance target that's an outer rim planet is you don't know the real answer and it may take seven or eight years to get it. Um, but it's a great way to prove that remote viewing can do double blind what nobody else can do. And so that is to tell you the exact mixture of atmosphere on the third moon of Saturn or something. 
seven or eight years before anybody actually knows what it is, what that answer is. Now, did that come long distance from Saturn or did it come from the future when someone actually knew the answer? Uh, that's still up in the air. We have no idea where that information comes from or how it gets to the subconscious. So we don't, we just don't know. But long distance targets are, are a fun target. It, I'll give you an example of a long distance target that I do every day. If, if I'm going into town and I'm going to be going to a shopping center, I usually sit down and concentrate a little bit on where I'm going to park my car. Uh, I make a firm decision that that empty space is mine. And when I get there, it will be empty for my car. And I drive into town, which is 38 miles away. So that's some distance. And when I arrive, I go to the parking space that I already know I'm going to park in. About 50% of the time, the parking space is open. Um, sometimes it isn't. But what I do is I'll sit in the parking lot, sit in the actual non-parking space with my blinker going waiting for the person to come out and get in the car and leave so I can park there. And that usually only takes about three to five minutes, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, so that's a way of targeting uh, distance. Um, so there's lots of different ways you can use the, the different targets. What I suggest you do is you get a hold of the, the uh, information that I showed you earlier. Um, this uh, these two books, uh, Stargate Archives. What this is, this is the actual science that was done in the early part of the remote viewing. Um, and it has all everything you could ever ask for in terms of how effects uh, occur with targets. Um, what happens when a target is is delivered uh you know minor minor tar uh, not minor targets small targets mini targets i find to be really fascinating because in actuality uh many targets were being done first um there's a man by the name of uh rene Walcollier, a frenchman who was doing mini targets with his daughter over uh, about an 80 kilometer distance. Uh, that's how far they live from one another. And they would set up small hand-drawn things on their kitchen table. And one would write the target, one would draw the target and the other would try to copy it uh, from that 78 or 80 kilometer distance. And then they'd mail the answer back and forth. And this was done in the um the 1930s or very very soon or very little bit of time before and a little bit of time after it got delayed by the second world war so it, it wasn't known until it was presented uh at the Sorbonne by uh by Rene Wilcoy. Uh he received a great uh applause when he presented his findings but he and his daughter did a lot of remote viewing in the 1930s. Likewise, what I just recently discovered is that um, that Dr. Ryan, uh, in his uh, his own research in ab about 1933, uh, talked in some of the letters that were published by uh, Sally Feather and and. Uh, uh, that came out in the book that was published of his letters. And he talks about uh, what he called real telepathy or, or the learning uh, the symbols from a distance, um, which is basically what Rene Wilcoye was doing in the, in the 30s. So, so the, these are all many, what I would call many targets. And, and they, they work, they, they work very effectively. What's interesting is the, 
the difference is René Walcayer, the symbols would be broken up. His daughter might draw a stick figure of a horse and he might have the head on one part of the paper and a tail on the other part of the paper or a boat would have a mast in one part of the paper and the bow of the boat in another part of the paper, that kind of thing. They, they were breaking up the bits and pieces of information that were coming in on the different mini targets where it obviously was not working that way with uh, Dr. Ryan. He, he was getting the, the symbols. So now you could say, well, he's getting the symbols because the person was selectively picking the symbol based on what their input was. And, and that's okay. Uh, they were so they were front loaded with the symbols, but there's no way they could know which symbol. So to get the kind of statistical result he was getting is extremely impressive. Uh, in my mind, I think it was extremely impressive. So uh, remote viewing has been around a long time. It just has been called other things. And the, the types of targeting uh, changes. If you're going to be teaching remote viewing, the there are a number of targets that are good and a number of targets that are bad. Uh, what I'd like to do is um, is bring up a, a paper, a small thing that I did to give you some examples of what would be continued, uh, what would be considered. A uh, good target versus a bad target, and the reasons why. So you can see kind of how the mind works with uh, with these. And uh, if you hang on a second, I will bring that up. Hopefully, uh, I'm going to bring these up one by one, and we'll talk about the targets. Um, hopefully. Let me see here. Uh, you should be able to share your screen, Joe. Yeah. Uh, share screen, right? Okay. Here's the first one. Hang on. There we go. Uh, can you all see that? Yes. Now we can see it. Okay. Uh, this is a, obviously an old picture. Um, you can see it's black and white. Uh, some might think that this doesn't make a very good target, but in fact, it makes an excellent target because the entropy is extremely high in this target because there's about an equal amount of shadow and uh, light. Uh, so as a photographic target, it makes a really great target. Um, also, it's uh, unique in that it's got a nice background our location and uh, it's got a couple people in it and it's got a couple animals in it. And obviously the function is uh, pretty clear. They're, they're mo either moving or going somewhere. Let me see here. I think it's on the paper. No, it wasn't on there, but it's a, uh, it's a family that's packing up to go west uh, from their earlier location. Uh, that's one example. So that's a pretty good target. Uh, let me see here. I'm going to go over here and put up another one. Uh, let me get the other one up here. Okay. Now, there we go. Now, th this is a uh, recognizable target. Uh, uh, if this was cut out of a magazine and presented as a target, this is also an excellent target um, because of the uh, the balances of light and dark. Uh, the most interesting thing here is the 
massive fort down here at the bottom. I don't know if you all can see my cursor or not, but it's a, the Castillo de San Marcos in St. Augustine, Florida. It's a, it's been there since 1695. This is where uh, the leader of the Seminole Indians came in under a white flag and he was held in this, this fort until his death. He came in to honorably negotiate a peace with the American army. And uh, this is before actually Florida became a state, I think. And they held him in this fort till he died, which is why the Seminole Indians have never signed a peace treaty with the United States government. And so they're treated a lot differently than most other Indian tribes in America, uh, First Nation tribes. Uh, if you cut this picture out of the magazine or where it came from, it would make an excellent target, except for one problem. What's the target in this picture would be the question asked. And most people would not just target the fort. Some might have a propensity to be negative about forts. So they might talk more about the city and some of the buildings in the city because of their age uh, when this picture was taken. So uh, it's not a good target. If it was scissored in a way that only the fort was presented as the target, then that would be a good target. But you would have to say, describe the actual facility as the requirement for targeting. If you didn't give a requirement for targeting, you could get almost anything about the fort from the fact that uh, people were in prison there to other reasons. I'm gonna show you a modification of that, of that uh, actual target. Let me uh, go back down here. Oh, heck. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not used to doing this, so it's going to take me a minute, just a second here. Mm -hmm. All right, it's taking me a minute here. Uh, Joe, if I may, that's interesting what you've said about entropy. Um, up until now, I've been under the impression that entropy is something that the target is doing and not so much the, the photograph of the target. So uh, no, they, there's, different there's two different kinds of entropy. Uh, one, one style of entropy has to do with, uh, has to do with the, uh, uh, has to do with, you know, an actual place and what's going on in the target. And the other type of, uh, entropy has to do with, uh, has to do with photographs. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. And it, it is confusing <laughs> to some degree. Um, okay. I, I've got this now. Let me just, uh, bring it up. Oh, oh my goodness, it's the same target. Is it better in color or black and white? Would be a good question. What do you think? Um, it's actually no better in color than it is in black and white other than you can identify more information maybe. Um, I would prefer targets in color, but they don't have to be. They can be black and white or color. It's easier to to determine their uh, entropy level in black and white, but it's not necessarily, it's not necessary in actuality. Uh, let's go to the next target, which uh, is uh, a little different. No, this is a good, this is a good one as an example. Okay.
Is this a good target? This is the Trail of Tears. Uh, a lot of you might think this is a great target, but it's not. It's a terrible target. And the reason why is it's not real. It's somebody's figment of imagination about what the Trail of Tears looked like. It may deliver that message, but it's a lousy remote viewing target because the uh, as good as the entropy might be, what you're going to get from this is going to be probably uh, a lot of different things. Uh, it's not specific. Uh, you will get everything from it's a photograph of a picture to uh, whatever the person was thinking when they painted it. Uh, it's, it's not a very good target for the reason that it's not real. It's kind of like you would never use as a target something like Superman sliding down a kid's slide holding a banana because no one in their right mind would ever decide that that, that was a decent target. <laughs> um, let me get the, the next target here. Okay. This is an interesting. That's a, this is a really excellent target. Uh, if this was scissored out of the magazine and used as a target, it's great. Um, there are people that would argue about uh, the fact that it could be a distance target or it could be something else, but uh, I think it's a great target because it's got the remote viewers on the little planet way in the background. And uh, we're remote viewing something far away, like it's on the moon. But what would be neat about this target is if the monitor in realizing what was being targeted, the moon, as an example, uh, might be able to ask some other questions that would be relative to where this person's standing. Uh, it might break through to the reality of the actual landing. Uh, so you could get more information about what was going on on the moon while they were in their spacewalk, uh, what they did specifically while on the moon. So that would be kind of cool. Um, I'll show you another, just one more target. I don't have a lot of these. see here these are very educational joe this is a great target for the same reason um this of course is the normandy landing uh during the second world war it's an excellent target because it's right at the beginning of the landing and so there's a lot of information going on here. And it's a great, there's a great deal of entropy here because there's life and death going on in the scene. Uh, there's also great shadow and light diversity here. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting things about photographs is the reason shadow and light are important is because it's changing constantly at the place where the photograph's taken. And so if it captures as much shadow in, as it does light, brightness of light, then it, it sort of captures the changing atmosphere of the, the reality, uh, so to speak. It actually captures a lot of entropy. So there's a lot of interesting things going on in this picture uh, that could be pursued uh, by a remote viewer. Uh, most remote viewers probably would not be able to identify where this is happening, but they would be able to identify the heavy steel frame in the front foreground and people in water, which is kind of interesting. 
Um, that's it. So another good target. And then we have one more, I think. Oh, this is different. I'm going to show you the whole the whole thing here because there's two things that can be said about it. Okay, it says war and peace at the top. Um, so if you were to take this whole piece as the target, it would not be as good a target as it would be if the drum itself was just cut out. The drum is an actual drum that was taken a photograph of in the Smithsonian Institute. So the drum is real. It was actually carried at some point in the uh, beginning of our country. And uh, so the drum would make a great target. And the fact that there's uh, lots of color and, and everything in it, it's really a good target. But leaving it all together as war and peace, it would be confusing, especially given the fact that they're talking about one one sentence wars with American Indians to a standoff in Afghanistan. I mean, that's awfully complicated. I would just scissor out the drum, drum and leave that as the blow it up and use it as a one page target. Uh, that would be a great target. I don't think there's any more targets on here, but I'm not sure. Uh, one more. Maybe I won't use that one. Here's a good one. This is uh, the last one I'll use as an example. Uh, let's see. Okay. As you can see, this is a really big photograph. This is right at the entry to Times Square. This building's been in like eight or nine films. It's under construction here, which makes it really interesting. Is this a good target for identifying this building or the location? It's really good for the location. Uh, the problem is it's also good for the building. Um, I would use it to target the building because I think the Buildings an important building. It's called the Wedge Building or something like that. Uh, it started out building. as an apartment building. The, the problem is it is located adjacent to the or right in the entry to Times Square. And that that causes some difficulties because a lot of people are going to jump to information about Times Square. But I think it's still a good target because the building itself is under construction and it's at a time long before Times Square was famous so I think that uh, it's a great target uh, you have you have judgment calls on some of these I mean there's a lot of buildings in this picture and somebody might say a lot of buildings in a downtown sequence but they should also get 19 30 something uh, here, that sort of thing. Uh, so it, it's, it's kind of a call and I, I would use it personally just for the building. Uh, I never considered a building as being a, a target with a lot of entropy, but like one under construction, like this one is, is, uh, that's something I hadn't thought of before. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not sure. Yeah. It's that's the live entropy. But the photograph itself has a lot of entropy because there's a, so much going on, it can never be backed up. Mm -hmm. You know, can't, historically can't be changed to any other thing. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's great. Let me uh, see what else is. I don't think there's anything else on that. No, that's it. That's the last of the. Well, we did have a couple of questions come in. If you're 
going yeah, to, sure. to take a few. Uh, uh, I think Chuck earlier asked about clarifying what how entropy enhances a target. I don't know, Chuck, have you sort of gotten an answer from some of the examples that Joe has given, or do you want Joe to go ahead and address that? I, the best thing I can do for, the, for you in that regard is I can go to entropy in the book here and read it to you. But the, the thing is, we know from, ex, from experience, okay, that the more entropy there is in the target, the more information's passed. What happens is uh, there's, a, there's a double effect that occurs. The first effect is you get a ton more information. The remote viewer gets a ton more information, rather. And the remote viewer will put down, instead of making uh, 10 statements about the target that might be accurate, they'll make 35 statements about the target. Hmm. Um, the, the problem is this. The higher the entropy, the greater number, of, the greater amount of noise usually occurs in the mind of the viewer. So a viewer might get a lot more information, but a lot more information might be inaccurate. In other words, uh, it's dependent on, it's really dependent on the, clar the clarity of the information pertinent to the target versus the information that's just noise that you're trying to listen through. Um, what, what happens in the, remote, in the mind with a remote viewer I'm speaking from experience here. What happens is your mind loads up with tons of uh, inappropriate material. When you get a really live uh, feed, so to speak, when you tag into a target in a way that you, you get your mind overloaded with information, we have a tendency we have a tendency to start listing, uh, we call it creativity, but we have a tendency to start listing inappropriate material, which is the noise with the appropriate material. What's nice about the entropy is more appropriate material gets above the noise, the noise level. So the information that you can pick off off the top mm -hmm is always going to be more accurate and it's going to be in depth better information about the target than when it's down here closer to the noise because then you're including a lot of the noise out of the top part of the noise uh, in other words you're 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 getting things that don't make a great deal of sense so you're you're trying to interpolate it you're trying to make it into something that's important about the target. And so you have a tendency to, to bury the accurate information in the inaccurate information that you're picking out of the noise. But when you have a really good clear target and a, and a really good tag into the information line or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. if the targets got a lot of entropy it's producing a huge amount of information up here in this area and that's a rich area to be picking your information out of versus when it's down here almost at the baseline of noise coming out of your your head um, but remote viewers you're getting noise all the time uh, but when you're in real world you know and you're acting in your real world, it's easy to see what's real and what isn't. It's not difficult cutting out the background noise that's going on inside your head. But when you're doing remote viewing, you're not in your real world. You're in your remote viewing world. And in the remote viewing world, the more, the more distance you have that gives you a greater deal of information that's of value, from the noise level, the more information you can provide about the target is going to be accurate. It's going to be real. It's when you get down really close to the noise level or where that, that 
line of information is really faint is where you run into problems because then you don't get clear information. You get bits of information that are noise and bits of information that is real and you mix them and you will begin to invent out of that mixing and it just clutters everything up. Uh, this, I, I, I don't know for sure and neither do the scientists what the actual bit rate is for transference of information, if you want to call it a bit rate. The, the problem is uh, science says the bit rate's very small, very low. So when you've got sufficient information up here where you can interlock all the bits of information, you have a greater understanding for what the target is so you fill in a lot of the blanks with your imagination and that filling in becomes more accurate so you are actually producing a much better picture of the target when you're down close to the noise you're getting as much noise bits as you are getting the target bits and it's hard to fill in those little holes and blanks and so what happens is you make more mistakes in your trans transliteration or however you want to call it. So it's more difficult to produce good information about the target. So you want to, as good, an inf as good a, a signal line as you can have, there is no actual signal line, by the way. I'm just using that as a, right. <laughs> as a way of expressing it. You, you want as good a connection to the target as you can get. And so the higher the entropy, the better the connection to the target. So, uh, for so any if, of uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, uh, to interrupt. Uh, the, um, so if, if, the, if the photograph itself, uh, just how um, compelling the photograph is, makes such a difference, is this why uh, outbounder sessions tend to draw better results because you're actually there and you're immersed in like every sense, all the senses? Is that, is that kind of how that works? Now I'm going to give you the scientific response. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, now I'm going to give you my response, okay? Um, I think the difference between the outbounder responses, you know, to an outbounder target versus a photographic target, I think when you have the photographic target, everything's set in stone. When you have the outbounder target, you have the outbounders reactions to things mm -hmm. which emote and i think that puts a higher level of uh puts a higher level of energy behind the the observances and whatnot um some of the targets that i've done with outbounders where they turn out to be exceptionally well done have a lot to do with the fact that um have a lot to do with the fact that the outbounder is following their instructions they're interacting as well as they possibly can with the target mm -hmm. let me give you an example of that in that i did a series of targets where i followed what was supposedly a spy okay uh, my targeting methodology was they gave me the social security number of this individual and called him a spy. I say him, I don't know if it was a him or her or an it, okay? Um, but they gave me the social security number. Uh, so when I was targeted on this person, I know since the person was acting as a spy, they were trying to do what spies do, collect information on where they were. And that means taking pictures, uh, picking things up on the site. So they're interacting with the site. Right. They're targeting the site. They're taking pictures of very specific items. So they're totally focused on the site. And those are the best remote viewings I've ever done <laughs> versus an outbounder who's interacting with the site 
there's going to be some things the outbounder is going to not like or not care about and some things they're going to care about more. And those are usually the things that come across. So if they think about things they care the most about as being less district descriptive of the site, then you see how that complicates things. But if it's a site they really like, like somebody really likes to eat and it's a, a diner, <laughs> yeah well yeah that's and, probably and gonna be a strong hit. time and all the chairs are empty <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna really like that but you know you understand what i'm saying yes uh, it's kind of a in some some outbounders uh, they're doing it because they have to um it's like one of the things we notice and this is so critically important i can't i cannot tell you how important this is when when a remote viewing is being done there's more participants in that one remote viewing than just a remote viewer you have the monitor you have the person who's collecting the information you have a number of different individuals in the case of remote viewing where you're doing either it's an outbound or a distant target a geographic target no matter what kind it is where it's being done for science, you have a scientist, a remote viewer, a monitor, a statistician. You got a number of different people. The only real, in a, in a scientific sense, the only person really interested in being right is the remote viewer. The scientist doesn't have to be. Remote viewing can totally fail or it can be a total success and the scientist gets to write it up both times and report it. And so if it's a good research protocol, the scientist gets credit whether it succeeds or fails, it doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter to the scientists what happens when they're the key proponent of the experiment. So how does that help a remote viewer? It doesn't help the remote viewer at all. But where everybody is totally focused on the outcome, and it's critically important to everybody participating, there is a 60 to 75% difference in the result. So there's got to be some function there that says things that are important to everybody participating is going to produce way more information than when only the remote viewer is interested in the outcome. So, so Joe, can you talk a little bit more about that, the importance of that intention when you're tasking? Yeah, it, it's called intention, attention, and expectation for outcome. If everybody doesn't share equally in those three functions, your remote viewings are never going to be top of the line. They just will never happen. Um, and, and the reason I say that is at the outset, of the science in remote viewing, which was done at Stanford Research Institute and Science Applications International Corporation, and now LFR, Laboratories for Fundamental Research, the remote viewing has gotten better and better over the years because everybody, everybody that participates in remote viewing goes out of the way to make it Abs make everyone absolutely sure that they're focused and they have a expectation for the outcome to be real, to, to, that it will be good. Um, and, and it's made like such an improvement in the research area on remote viewing that many people initially accuse some of us of cheating. You know, it's like, oh, you can't be doing it that good because we can't, you know, <laughs> and it, it's be another lab. Another lab would say, we, we never get those results. Why do you always get those results? Wow. Well, the reason why is because we go out of our way to make sure that everyone participating really has an expectation for a, a great outcome that it has to be successful. And it is. And Nowhere was, I will tell you, nowhere was it more successful than in the Stargate program. 
where the targets were everyone had a high expectation for the need to have accuracy and near perfection in the remote viewing and everyone had this expectation that it was going to happen because it was giving them information they couldn't get any other way and it was extremely successful regardless of what you may read or hear i can prove it that it was successful so um and and a lot of it was life and death i mean it had everything to do with life and death it had everything to do with and, and how much how much drugs did we take away from the cartels this week that kind of thing so uh it it was very successful for that reason but if you don't have that expectation for outcome and you don't have that focus it's just never going to happen now the downside to that is stress hmm. you know you've you got a remote viewer and if the remote viewer feels that no one is no one really cares how well they do the stress on the remote viewer is so great that the remote viewer will just say, I don't care. It, whatever happens, I just don't care. Hmm. But if everybody really cares and the remote viewer knows that they're being supported 100%, the stress is even greater and the success is great. So hmm. that's just the way it works out. Uh, we don't know why. There, there's some... I can hold up 1.8 million words here in science in four volumes. And there's probably fewer, fewer answers here than there are answers. But I you want to show this one time. See what it says right here? Entropy, entropy right there on the cover. <laughs> yep. That's how important entropy is. And what I just told you about focus and uh, expectation for outcome is probably more important than the entropy. Uh, that's two things that we do know are important and that, that works. So if you're gonna if you're gonna train somebody, you really want to you want to you want to get a couple of these volumes and you want to study targeting and you want to really spend some time building a pool that's going to make the viewer feel like they're getting a grasp on what it is they're doing. And the viewer has to know, is, that a, is this a, are we using a distance, distant target pool? Are we using a mini pool? Are we using a, a, a geographic pool? I mean, what kind of pool are we using here? Because every kind of pool has its own special uniqueness about it where what the viewer has to concentrate on is a little bit different. It's a little bit stranger or a little bit more unique. And so unless the viewer knows what kind of pool they're dealing with, they're winging it. Right. I mean, they're really winging it. And, and the different outcome, the outcomes are going to be all over the place. They're just going to be everywhere because the entropy is going to be different on every single target. So if you create a mini pool, the entropy has to be the same for each target. It has to be the same for each target, no matter what kind of pool it is. Uh, that's critically important. And, and like I say, the expectation for outcome has to be as, as important. Uh, anyway. Okay. Um, a question came in from uh, Sally Drucker. In spontaneous uh, psi cases and some research studies, psi appears related to strong emotions. Are RV targets ever deliberately chosen to be emotionally evocative in some way? You know, that's a good question. Um, you, what I found, it's not the target itself. It's the reaction people have to it. Mm -hmm. So it's not only the reaction of the viewer, it's the reaction of other people that are involved in the, in the psychic question, you know, in, in the psychic event. Um, because when you, when you deal, when you deal with, uh, 
when you deal with more important or more critical types of targets, what happens is a lot of it has to do with surprise because the answers come out of left field. Mm -hmm. they, they don't come up, they don't come from where you would expect them to come from. Um, I, I give you an example. Um, and I, and I used it the other day when I was explaining it to someone. Um, there was a case, it's, it's sim, kind, of, kind of similar to uh, the young lady that was recently found to be uh, a case, a homicide case. Right, right. Gabby, and, Gabby, yeah, Patini. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it was somewhat similar to that. And what it was is, is um, she get this, it wasn't a lady, it was a guy and he got into trouble with somebody and and uh, he, he wound up uh, getting involved with the police. And his interaction with the police uh, made the police wary of him. And mm -hmm. so later he was found uh, to be dead. And uh, they, they wanted to take it all back to the interaction he was having at the time. And the input I had was completely opposite. It had nothing to do with the interaction that he had to cause the police to come into the, into, you know, into the scene. What it had to do with was the police themselves. Hmm. And I made the comment, you know, it's a shame you guys haven't investigated the police officers involved. Hmm. Never wow. mind the incident in itself. And it turns out that one of the police officers was involved in his uh, subsequent death and and oh, wow that's that's hard to sell but but it surprised everybody and it surprised me but you know it was just one of those things that you know what what do you do when that happens you got to be honest and uh, and mm -hmm. you know it wasn't appreciated i can tell you <laughs> so so you know um and i've had I've had every kind of surprise you can imagine, you know, like police help us find our first cousin. He disappeared and we don't know where he went, what happened to him. And after a couple of days, I realized that it's the family themselves that took care of the problem. And, mm -hmm. and I don't want to be anywhere around the family after that. Right. And it turns out later they find that guy buried under the house or something, you know, bizarre things happen like that uh in fact i had a case like that where i said you find the body under the house in the in the crawl space and the sheriff went in the crawl space twice at the insistence of the person that was looking for this missing person and the sheriff said there are no bodies in the crawl space and so i told the guy i said well what you need to do is find yourself a cadaver dog and gain access to the crawl space yourself, which he did, and they found the body in the crawl space. So that's a sheriff went in there twice and couldn't find a body, but the dog found it instantly. You know, stuff like that. You got you got to go with the go with the answer. So so we had a couple of people actually um, ask questions about um, like the target photos and what what happens if the target photo has been altered or um, edited somehow what what does the viewer pick up on how does how does that affect the session well a really good viewer should pick up on the alter okay huh. okay um that that's that would be my answer i you know i've been i've been given targets and envelopes that weren't targets um you know it you you run into people in different agencies who don't believe this stuff and they'll target you with an empty envelope and and that's that becomes the answer so when you hand it back to them and say you know next time bring a real target they they're pretty you know that's like a big slap that answers their question for them basically right that, that, it, yeah. that you figured that out <laughs> Well, you don't figure it out. It's just, it's when nothing, I mean, when nothing happens, 
yeah. that's got to be the answer. And uh, usually it is. And, and it's unfortunate that they test you that way, but they do sometimes. Cool. So, um, all right. We had a couple other ones here. Um, how about uh, the importance of wording the tasking? How important is that when you're presenting it to a critical? Yeah. If you don't ask for it, you don't get it. But the remote viewer, does, there's no reason a remote viewer needs to see that. Okay. That's right. Because your, your default tasking for yourself is whatever makes the tasker happy. That's right. My default tasking. Yeah. Most people don't understand tasking. So when I work for a police department or a sheriff's department or something, or the FBI or some other place, and, and they come in and give me an envelope, I know instinctively what they put down, what they wrote down as the tasking put in the envelope probably is an assumption, probably isn't right. You know, they don't know anything about remote viewing. That's what I accept. So I had to come up with something that would get me to the target in spite of it. And what I did is I said, okay, let me give them whatever's going to make them happy with the target. And that's my default tasking. And it, it works like gangbusters. And, and so that's what I get. So uh, in some of the uh, examples you provided us today where you were clipping out the fort from the rest of the photograph, that's affecting the, the entropy of that photograph, right? Now, does that make it less of an effective target in that way? Uh, it could, but in most cases it won't. You think that the importance of focusing the viewer on that particular well, portion let me of the you, photo? Let me tell you how entropy is decided on a photograph. Okay. You, you take, if you have a, let's say you have a, uh, a set of 150 photographs you want to use. You want to check the entropy of the photographs for that target pool mm -hmm. you would decide which which square inch of that photograph are you going to use to measure entropy upper right corner center bottom left corner if you whatever you pick you pick the same for all photographs the same corner for every same same okay. spot the okay. same square inch and that will give you a balanced entropy for your target pool, hmm. but you need to take it from whatever the same square is on every photograph. Right. You should and, get something roughly equivalent in all of them. And if you if you had a larger view, I guess you could use photo editing software to position whatever was most interesting in that photograph in that same quadrant, right? Something like that. No, I no, just, it just doesn't matter. I just cut whatever is important about the photograph. Okay. And use that. Uh, and you got to remember, intent comes into it well as well. And what what's the primary focus of the photo? You know, what was the reason the photograph was taken? Right. Um, I'm trying to think of some something that would modify that. I can't. Um, you know. It, you make rules up from what you find when you experiment. And there's a lot of experiments that are done that, that give you a rule that's probably true. Not absolutely sure to be true, but probably true because it's generally the same every time you do it. And so you make an assumption that if you follow that rule, it improves the probability of getting something. So there's lots of rules like that in remote viewing where the probability of getting something is improved piecemeal by every rule, it's true. So if you follow enough of the rules, you get a better response. That there's something else there that we have not we probably never study. We don't even know that it's in front of our face, but it should be studied because it transcends all other rules. It's like there, there's something that happens in remote viewing when it's got a certain a certain need to it to have to occur in a certain way. 
It just happens that way. Hmm. And I can't explain it. And I'm sure the scientists can't explain it. But there are so many times when I have done a remote viewing, presented the remote viewing, and someone has uh, denigrated the response or said something smart back to me, and it's got my ire up. Mm -hmm. And I'll get something spontaneously that far and away clears the deck. <laughs> so to speak. Uh, right. the, the Russian submarine's a perfect example. Uh, the, the first analysis by the, the, uh, by the National Security Council on my response was total fantasy. And it, it did something to me I lit a that fire I, underneath. I had to say, well, that that <laughs> fantasy will be launched in 120 days or 112 days or whatever it was, and that's when it was launched. So th there's just something that happens when you get tweaked like that, and you yeah. get tweaked back, and you just it comes in your head and you use it. Wow, that's great. Um, yeah, so uh, whatever your motivation, right? Uh, yeah. Latch on to it and, and go with it. So, wow. So we've uh, we've kind of gone over time. We we had uh, lots of questions. Do um, you feel up for taking a few more if you want? Or sure. I mean, how, how are we doing? Okay, all right. So sure. let's see. Um, what else can I ask here? Um, Todd asked if you, you mentioned how you can't outdistance remote viewing. How much further have you gone into the future after your ultimate time machine book? And how much further in space have you gone uh, with your work with uh, Tunde's UFO book? Are those things you well, want to I've gone, cover? I've, I've, I've gone, well, I, the target, I, I did both simultaneously. When, when I was working at uh, the Monroe Institute, Mm -hmm. on long weekends with Robert Monroe. The, the idea was they were trying to improve my cool down period, my, my prep period for doing a remote viewing because my prep period was starting to take upwards of an hour mm -hmm. because I was, for two years, I was the only remote viewer left and I was doing six or seven remote viewings a day. And, uh, and so I was having a hard time getting stuff out of my head from the one before and so anyway they they paid robert monroe to try to use uh his hemisphere hemisphere synchronization stuff to to help me with that and i was able to cut that uh two or three minutes so you could say it worked really well mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. what i did is i just learned to shut it off and move on to the next target um but uh, when I was doing that training, someone, they would send someone out from uh, Fort Meade every now and then to test me to see whether or not the training was effective or whether or not I had learned anything. And, and they, were, they were very pleased whenever they came out. So if things were working fine. And they, Bob Monroe woke me up from a nap one day because somebody had brought a list of targets out and the targets were of mars only i didn't know that i'd been napping and he woke me up i was sleeping in the black box your remote viewing place is the best place to take a nap <laughs> <laughs> it's usually real quiet i've listened um, to some of your recordings it sounds like uh yeah you had a good rest there <laughs> yeah and and so uh he woke me up and we did the the targeting and i thought it was earth and i thought it was a new discovery because they used geographic locations you know uh gps's mm -hmm. and it wasn't it was on mars and i didn't know that every every planet in the solar system has a G gps location mm -hmm. and uh i just thought it was a new discovery so i went on giving them the information but at the end i had a sense that there were other there was other information there that seemed to be more psychic than anything else and so i gave them that too but it dealt with 
uh, entities that appeared to be human, uh, only twice their size. And so I came out, I said, what, what kind of discovery was this? And they said, oh, you need to open the envelope to know that answer. And, and Bob Monroe, they had given him the envelope, he put it in his shirt pocket. And he had forgotten, he would even forgotten about that. But he pulled the envelope out and opened it up and it said, Mars 1 million BC. So you could say that's as far back as I've been. It's pretty impressive. Um, what I have found going back in the past is it's much easier than going forward. If you go back in the past, uh, we pretty much have far and away exceeded our ability to, uh, to constitute uh, reasons for things happening. You know, like our physics has gotten a lot better. Our math has gotten a lot better, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, so that things don't just happen as a mystery. Uh, but if you go into the future, we there are concepts existing in the future. We, we haven't gotten to them yet. So remote viewing becomes ex exceptionally difficult going into the future because now you're dealing with concepts you can't explain. Mm -hmm. And so the information has no logic basis. So it's just information. Is it real? I don't know. You know, does does someone dying but not going away like they normally do? Is you know that that makes for some interesting ideas in terms of concepts or uh, going into the future and finding out there's a time machine, for instance. Oh wow, when did they make that? And how did they do that? You know, that kind of thing. It's very difficult to, to get that information and understand it. Well, let me ask you, uh, let me ask you one last question. This uh, kind of relates a little bit to what you just mentioned about uh, time frames and everything. Um, the question is, are real targets better partly because they connect us with the target in the past or present? So like something that's tangible, for instance, is that, is that why they make better targets? They make better targets because we know the answers. Okay. I, I, you know, remote viewing is kind of a do it now, find out the real answer later, you know, that kind of thing. All right. So I have a real problem with uh, doing targets that I can't get feedback for. And, and the only reason I have a problem with that is, okay, um, it is the answer real or not? Right. I don't know. I, I've done targets that I probably will never know the answer to um, because people have either paid me to do them or, or I was in a situation where I was asked a question and I gave them the answer I got. And I won't know the answer and neither will they until we reach the point where reality allows that to occur. Right. Um, I, I can tell you this, I, I was more right about ufos than not hmm. my my sense of ufos it, it it's kind of a split between an entity we don't understand mm -hmm. to an entity we do uh, for instance in all the great oceans do we know all the different fish that live in the ocean no probably not yeah do we know all the entities that breathe air probably not so UFOs may in fact be a cross between uh, an interdimensional type of animal that lives in our atmosphere and comes and goes as it wills. You know, I don't know the answer, but I can tell you that a lot of the answers about UFOs fits that category where uh, it could be a new type of whale only it breathes air and doesn't breathe water. Hmm or doesn't live in water, it lives in the air. I don't, I don't know, but it's that kind of response you get. So where do you go with that? You know? <laughs> I don't <How> know. 
Wow. Well, uh, we've we've gone well over our time. Uh, this has been just a fascinating discussion, Joe, and it's so insightful. Uh, you know, I've learned so much more about uh, targets today than I have in a long time. So uh, thank you so much for being here and, uh, and presenting to us. And thank the rest of you uh, who are watching this. Uh, we, we can't do it without your support. So, um, you know, as I said before, if you uh, please consider becoming a Rhyme member, We'll do uh, talks again next month. And um, thanks uh, for being here. And we'll pretty much wrap this one up. So take Thank care. You. Thanks again, Joe. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. Bye-bye, everyone.